I'm honored to be here today, albeit in the digital world. I sincerely thank you for inviting me to participate by video conferencing, thereby avoiding the enormous carbon footprint of long distance jet travel. This is the kind of leadership that all contemporary organizations should be modeling. You might well be wondering why I'm so concerned about climate change in museums. Well, as a graduate student doing archaeological research in Canada's remote subarctic, I lived with a band of Dene hunters for six months. Their culture is thousands of years old and is based on intimate knowledge of one of the most unforgiving environments in the world. And it is there that I learned firsthand the meaning of social ecology, that social and environmental issues are intertwined and both must be considered simultaneously. This inescapable truth that our lives are inextricably linked with the natural world inspires my belief that the global museum community must now take a stand on climate change. This is a moral imperative for museums as climate change is no longer just about science and politics, it's about social justice. So I come to you today as a messenger with the intention of connecting the unconnected. That is to bring together information and ideas from various sources in order to define the big picture as it relates to museums and their role in the climate challenge. And please note that my use of the word museum is inclusive. It includes art galleries, heritage sites, and science centers. I'll now go into the science of climate change and how it is throwing our civilization into chaos. Suffice it to say that levels of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere now exceed 410 parts per million, the highest in the last 20 million years. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, recently issued the latest evidence of climate change destruction across the globe, with the warning that to stay below global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius, we will need to cut our emissions by half in the next 12 years. Staying under 1.5 degrees also means keeping more than 85% of our fossil fuel reserves in the ground. Most importantly, the panel notes that limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees will require rapid and far-reaching changes in all aspects of society of a sort that we've never seen before. Now, if these numbers strike you as small and inconsequential, please consider these projections from the IPCC. At two degrees of warming, the melting of ice sheets will pass the tipping point of collapse, flooding dozens of cities around the globe this century. Beyond the sea level rise, damages just from river flooding alone will grow as much as 60-fold in the United Kingdom. Global economic input will be reduced by 13%, 400 million more people will suffer from water scarcity, and even in the northern latitudes, heat waves will kill thousands of people each summer. Some scientists have also concluded that climate-induced societal collapse is now inevitable in the near term, with serious ramifications for the lives of all of us here today. And I note that the evidence is rapidly accumulating in support of this chilling observation. Yes, all of us now have permission to freak out. We need to acknowledge that there's no preventing climate change as the contraction of life is already underway. What is at stake is the fate of global society and the immense web of life and all that supports it including all that we have learned and accomplished as a species. So with a 97% scientific consensus on the human causes of climate change, what is the problem? Why are we not confronting climate change with our collective will and resources? There are many explanations, I'll mention a couple of them. First, climate change is a taboo subject, not to be talked about with family, friends, and colleagues. In fact, the most important thing that we can do to bring about climate action is to talk about climate change and its solutions with everyone we know. We must have conversations about this most uncomfortable subject, including the immorality of inaction. We're living a massive lie about the impending catastrophe of climate change. Second, museum workers must also um, contend with the widely held belief that museums must protect their neutrality, lest they fall prey to special interest groups or alienate their supporters. 
This claim of neutrality underlies the belief that museums may abstain from addressing societal issues because they have unique missions which absolve them from greater accountability. There's no such thing as museum neutrality. Museums are social organizations with the responsibility to participate in society. The good news from the IPCC report is that slowing climate warming is still within reach. With an enormous and united effort, the world is still capable of keeping global temperatures from increasing by more than 1.5 degrees. What we must avoid now are the merchants of doom who claim that we're ruined anyway, so let's not do anything. Then there are those who propose radical technological experiments such as geoengineering to deal with climate change or even going to Mars. This is distracting and dangerous nonsense as we have possibilities and solutions here and now. Enter museums, 55,000 of them, the largest self-organized franchise in the world. They are the world's public storefronts where people can learn about climate change in non-threatening and personally meaningful ways. There's no doubt that museums are already empowered to play a key role in addressing climate change because they have several unique characteristics that distinguish them from all other organizations. In addition to their deep view of time, museums are grounded in their communities and are expressions of locality. They are a bridge between science and culture. They bear witness by assembling evidence and knowledge and making things known. They are seed banks of sustainable living practices that have guided our species for millennia. They are skilled in making learning accessible, fun, and engaging, and they are some of the most free and creative work environments in the world. In short, there are no other organizations with this singular combination of historical consciousness, public accessibility, and unprecedented public trust. Museums must now honor this public trust and translate these precious qualities into concrete action to address climate change. I challenge each of you to consider yourself a sentient being on Earth with the responsibility to protect the only planet we have. Stop or reduce your long-distance jet travel. There's now a model for a carbon-free conference. Reduce your meat consumption as meat production releases as much greenhouse gas emissions as cars, trains, ships, and airplanes combined. Second, each of us is part of a family. If the next generation matters to you and the children born to it do as well, what about their children's children? Write a letter to your grandchildren, your children, siblings, partner, or even yourself and tell them what you were doing in the early 21st century when the earth was unraveling from the pressures of climate warming. Next, I challenge all museums to revisit your vision and mission and ask some big questions such as why does your museum exist? What changes are you trying to affect? What solutions will you generate? And what are your non-negotiable values? Second, tell your visitors how climate change and disruption came to be. We urgently need museums to provide cultural frameworks that challenge and identify the myths and myth misperceptions that threaten all of us, such as the, the fact that economic growth and consumption are essential to our well-being. Third, develop an advocacy policy for your museum, which defines what issues are important and how your museum will address and respond when confronted with moral and civic challenges, such as climate change. In short, use your personal and organizational agency to take action to make the world a better place. Museums are key civic resources whose potential as forces for good has yet to be fulfilled. In closing, there are two critical things to keep in mind as we navigate the next 12 years. First, Corporations are the leading cause of climate change. Just 100 fossil fuel companies have been the source of 71% of our greenhouse gas emissions. These corporations have also funded climate change denial while expanding fossil fuel extraction while they still can. We cannot address climate change until we challenge the corporate power that is blocking systemic change. Second, make space for your grief. If you're feeling anxious and emotional about the perils of climate change, you're not alone. It can leave one feeling powerless and overwhelmed. 
This is valid and logical, but we will need to channel these emotions into positive and effective action. We need to support each other and move through this together while holding on to hope with intention. In the words of the American poet farmer Wendell Berry, if we are serious about these big problems, we've got to see that the solutions begin and end with ourselves. I'm hoping that museum workers, indeed all cultural workers, will become serious about the big problems, just as you are doing here today. My congratulations on your foresight and courage, and thank you again for inviting me to speak.